right, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the first principle of pharmacology, which is pharmacokinetics, and specifically spending some time discussing how drugs get absorbed into the body and then into the bloodstream. All right, let's look at pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is the sequence of events that occurs after a drug is administered to a patient. Once a drug has been given, it's available for absorption into the bloodstream and eventually delivered to the target sites or target cells where it's going to exert an action. After the drug is absorbed into the bloodstream, it gets distributed to various fluids and tissues in the body. And then at that point, the body begins breaking it down or metabolizing the drug. At some point during that time, the drug begins to be excreted, primarily through the kidneys. Because the body immediately begins to break the drug down and excrete the drug, the amount of drug available to the target tissue quickly becomes less and less over time. So a drug must be given repeatedly in order to keep drug levels up and maintain concentrations at a desirable level. All right, let's talk about drug absorption and this concept of bioavailability of a drug. The term absorption refers to the movement of drug into the bloodstream after it's been administered to a patient. The term bioavailability refers to the actual quantity of drug administered that enters the systemic circulation and eventually reaches the intended target cells. If a drug has a bioavailability of one, that means 100% of the drug was absorbed. This would be seen in like an IV drug. Um, there are no drugs that have bioavailabilities greater than one, only one or less than one. Before a drug can reach its site of action, it must pass across a series of cellular membranes that make up the absorptive surfaces of the sites of administration. The degree to which a drug is absorbed and reaches the general circulation is called the bioavailability, and this is going to be different with different uh, methods of administration of drugs. So for instance, for an IV drug, this drug is one that's given directly into the bloodstream. So 100% of that drug goes into the bloodstream and the bioavailability is going to be one. An IM drug has to pass a couple of cellular membranes before it gets into the bloodstream. Now, muscle is very well vascularized, so there's lots of capillaries and muscles, but the drug still has to get into the capillaries. So the bioavailability is just gonna be maybe a little bit slightly less than one for an IM drug. Now, a sub-Q, drug given under the skin is given in a location where there's very poor tissue perfusion between the skin and the body wall. And it, that drug's going to have to diffuse a lot farther to eventually get absorbed into the capillaries. So the bioavailability of a sub-Q is going to be significantly less than one. And it's similar for an oral drug too, or PO drug. That's going to have a bioavailability quite less than um, the value of one because it has to pass through the membrane of the intestinal tract and it also has to pass through capillary membranes in order to eventually reach the circulation. Okay, so I will spend the rest of this video talking about some of the factors that affect drug absorption. You can see there's a list here that's pretty long, but today I'm going to mostly be talking about the mechanism by which drugs are absorbed through cell membranes, how the pH of a drug or the ionization status of a drug affects its absorption into a cell, and the solubility of a drug. Now these other things are very important as well, but we'll talk about that later. In order to understand drug absorption, we must look at the cell membrane. Remember, the cell membrane is a lipid bilayer with different types of proteins in the membrane and different sorts of channels in the membrane as well. The solution of extracellular fluid on the outside of the cell and the cytoplasm on the inside of the cell are both aqueous environments whereas the phospholipid bilayer is a lipid or fatty layer that prevents the passage of certain large molecules and hydrophilic molecules and things like that, such that the cell membrane is only selectively permeable to certain small ions and organic molecules, and it's going to be controlling what gets into the cell and what gets out of the cell too. 
molecules that are charged are going to have a harder time to get in, whereas a lipid soluble molecule is going to have an easier time absorbing through that cell membrane. There are some molecules and larger molecules that actually have to take protein channels to get in, and some drugs have to use active transport through some of these specialized proteins in order to get into the cell. Okay, we're going to look at four different ways in which drugs can cross the cell membrane. The first one pictured here is called passive absorption or simple diffusion. This method of absorption relies on the fact that there were small pores in the cell membrane which will allow small molecules to travel from the extracellular to the intracellular space. It doesn't require any energy and it's probably the most common method of drug absorption. It does rely on a concentration gradient across that membrane. It also helps if the drug molecules are small that will speed up absorption. If the temperature of the body is higher, that will speed up absorption too. The thickness of the membrane is going to also determine the diffusion rate and most importantly, the quality of the drug itself, whether it's lipophilic or hydrophilic. And we will talk about this more in just a second. Okay, the second method of drug absorption across the cell membrane is called facilitated diffusion. This method of drug transportation requires cell membrane carrier proteins, which take these molecules in, transport them through, and into the intracellular space. This process is a little bit quicker than passive absorption. It does rely on a concentration gradient, but it does not require energy. The third method of transport across a cell membrane of a drug is called active transport. Now this method requires energy in the form of ATP. They're showing it down here in this picture. This picture, by the way, is an example of an active transport system which is common in the body. This is a sodium potassium ATPase pump which pumps sodium out of the cell against its concentration gradient and pumps potassium into the cell against its concentration gradient. So again, this requires a form of energy and it also requires these drug transport proteins in the cell membrane. So these drug transporters require energy and they are specific to certain molecules and certain electrolytes. Again, they usually pump something against the concentration gradient. While we're on the topic of active transport, I wanna talk about a specific drug transporter that you'll hear a lot about. And this is called P-glycoprotein. This is probably the best described drug transporter. P-glycoprotein, or otherwise known as P, GP. This is a cell membrane drugs transporter pump which uses ATP and it's one of the best known drug transporter pumps in mammalian tissues and what it does is it actually with this being a cell, it actually pumps drug out of the cell. It acts in a protective manner to prevent that cell from developing toxicities from some substance it doesn't like. And in the body specifically, this P-glycoprotein likes to pump drugs away from protected sites such as the intestine and the kidney, the placenta, the liver, and especially the brain here because the brain can have all kinds of negative effects from drugs. So that protein is trying to get drug out of the brain. This P-glycoprotein is coded by a particular gene called the MDR1 gene. This stands for multi-drug resistant one. And we'll talk a lot more about this because we see genetic defects in certain herding breeds of dogs in which their P-glycoprotein pump doesn't work correctly and therefore drugs can collect in certain parts of the body such as the nervous system and cause increased sensitivities to certain drugs. The last way that a drug can get into a cell is called pinocytosis, pinocytosis. In this case, the extracellular substances, which may be drugs or electrolytes or something like that, other large molecules, are actually taken in by a portion of the cell membrane across the cell wall and eventually into the cytoplasm. This process does use some energy as well.
right, let's look at some factors that affect drug absorption through a cell membrane. The first is the solubility of the drug. Many drugs can pass through a cell membrane only if they are in the unionized or non-ionized form. That means they have no charge, either positive or negative. The problem is that most drugs are present in the body in both the ionized form and the non-ionized form. The pH of the drug and the pH of the body is going to determine the degree to which a drug becomes ionized and thus is either able to be absorbed or not able to be absorbed. Okay, so in order to understand that, we need to look at the ionization status of a drug and how it can change with the pH of the body system that the drug is in. Remember, ionization is a process whereby a molecule acquires a negative or a positive charge. An ionized molecule has a charge and is water soluble, but doesn't easily pass through cell membranes. However, an ionized molecule can travel through aqueous solutions, such as the bloodstream or the extracellular fluid. It can be dissolved in the cytoplasm and it can easily be excreted through the kidney. On the other hand, a non-ionized molecule or one that is lipid soluble can easily pass through a cell membrane, but may need some extra help in getting transported through the bloodstream. So drugs can exist both in the ionized and the non-ionized forms. Another way to look at this is to think of drugs like weak acids and bases. Weak acids and bases can easily switch between ionized form and a non-ionized form. As you can see in my examples where the pink on the top is showing the weak acid ionization and the blue on the bottom is showing the weak base ionization formula. Weak acids and weak bases will switch between ionized and non-ionized forms depending on the pH of the solution that it's in. So, in an aqueous solution, a drug that acts like a weak acid will give up a proton, becoming what is called a conjugate base. Protons in solution will jump on a base, which will convert it into its conjugate acid. It's important to point out that acids and bases in their natural state have no charge or are unionized or non-ionized, whereas their conjugate acids and conjugate bases do have a charge or they are ionized. All right, let's see how this works using aspirin as an example. Aspirin is a weak acid. In an aqueous solution, aspirin will dissociate into protons and its conjugate base. Remember, the stomach environment is an acid environment in an aqueous solution, so it's filled with lots and lots of protons. So in the acid stomach environment, the conjugate base form of aspirin takes up lots of those free protons and therefore most of the aspirin in the stomachs ends up being in the non-ionized lipid soluble form. So drugs that are acidic make good oral drugs because most of the drug in the stomach ends up being in the non-ionized or uncharged form, which is lipid soluble and therefore more likely to cross the cell membrane of the stomach and be absorbed into the bloodstream. Once that drug has been absorbed through the cell wall of the stomach, it's suddenly in a pH that's a lot more neutral than it was before, a pH of about 7.4. So the protons jump off the drug and now the drug is going to exist mostly in the ionized form or the more water soluble form. And it's going to have an easier time going through the extracellular fluid and then being transported in the bloodstream to the cells.